Well known to you, Peng Che, a professor of rhetoric at UC Berkeley. His talk is called Benedict Anderson's Cosmopolitan Leanings. Thank you. I've heard Ben being called many, many things before, but this is the first time I've heard him being called a lovely man. I would never have dared to call him a lovely man, so it's lovely that you did. Um, <coughs> A paper written to honor the memory of a teacher, I think, is an appropriate place to acknowledge a debt and also to begin to mark points of departure and difference. And I want to speak today about Ben Anderson's ambivalent relation to cosmopolitanism. Ben felt an intense love for the Indonesian nation, which in many respects provided the experiences that underwrote his celebrated account of nationalism. This made him a passionate defender of popular nationalism, which he distinguished from both statism and also racial chauvinism. I think it's not excessive to say, and some of you have already said this, that among thinkers of the late 20th and early 21st century, Ben was probably the most vigorous defender of the continuing legitimacy of the nation as a political community in an age of globalization, even as he recognized the fraying of the nationalist project. Accordingly, he was extremely critical of post-nationalism of the kind espoused by Arjun Apadurai, which was invoked two decades ago and may still be today. But what about the older practical discourse of cosmopolitanism, which has a universal normative dimension? While not entirely dismissive, Ben was clearly skeptical. In 1994, when I was a graduate student, I co-edited Cosmopolitics, Thinking and Feeling Beyond the Nation, a collection of essays on the new cosmopolitanism. To help me out, and this is but one example of his great kindness to and unwavering support for his students, Ben generously agreed to contribute a chapter, and this was a revision of the second of the Carpenter Lectures he delivered at the University of Chicago in April 1993. In this chapter, we titled Nationalism, Identity, and the Logic of Seriality, and subsequently reprinted in the specter of comparisons, he argued that the cosmopolitan hybridity of diasporic subjectivities in a globalized world lacks universality because it is in reality a form of ethno-racial identity that originated from the census categories of colonial governmentality. Underwritten by the logic of bound seriality, these categories engender identities that are essentialist and closed. Diasporic cosmopolitanism was not, and I quote, a meaningful cosmopolitanism, since it is at bottom simply an extension of a census style, identitarian conception of ethnicity, and lacks any universal grounding, end quote. In the worst scenario, it leads to a form of long-distance ethnic nationalism with deplorable political consequences, such as the funding of extremist groups in the countries of their ancestral origin by diasporic ethnic communities in the North Atlantic. It is therefore noteworthy that in his writings in the later half of the 2000s, Ben began to characterize cosmopolitanism in a more positive light, as an important source of nourishment for anti-colonial patriotism. Under three flags, Anarchism and the Anti-Colonial Imagination, 2005, a study of three patriotic intellectuals from the Spanish Philippines at the end of the 19th century, Isabella de los Reyes, Jose Rizal, and Mariano Pons, highlights two cosmopolitan dimensions of their practices the complex uh, cosmopolitan intertextuality of their writings and their multilingual epistolary web of relations and the transnational rhizomal anarchistic networks that informed anti-colonial nationalist movements against Spain by connecting Manila to Cuba via various European capitals, Hong Kong and Japan, the Americas and the Caribbean. Colonial Cosmopolitanism, an essay that was written in 2008 but published in 2012, analyzed the demotic cosmopolitan ethos of Kui Tiam Zheng, the Peranakan Chinese journalist in the late colon uh, colonial Dutch East Indies and early independence Indonesia, as expressed in the linguistic hybridity of his writings. And of course, Kui is the person who wrote the memoir, Jumbo Burduri, that Henk uh, just mentioned. I have, of course, a selfish reason for focusing on Ben's late swerve towards cosmopolitanism. The relation between cosmopolitanism and nationalism had been a matter of ongoing friendly disagreement between us for over 20 years. 
I agreed with him that it was premature to speak of a popular cosmopolitan consciousness. However, I saw the persistence of the popular nation in an age of globalization as a matter of its efficacy, with a nod to Lenin's argument about the self-determination of nations in the struggle against imperialism, as an agent of progressive change that pressed against the territorial state and its institutions and international and transnational bodies. For me, the nation does not have the robust universal grounding that Ben attributed to it, simply because it is constitutively vulnerable to contamination by state imperatives. And this made it impossible to clearly demarcate popular from official nationalism the way that Ben wished to. In line with Friedrich Meinecke's cosmopolitanism and the national state, I argued that cosmopolitanism in fact predated and was compatible with nationalism in an earlier era prior to the tightening of the hyphen between the nation and the state. And therefore, one should study the genesis and effects of both cosmopolitanism and nationalism and their conflictual embrace in a cosmopolitical force field where processes of globalization could be enabling. In contradistinction, Ben distinguished contemporary diasporic cosmopolitanism from nationalism in terms of an antithesis between particularity and universality. The former is based on the particularistic subject of ethnicity. Globalization exacerbates this particularistic politics because it enables a quasi-planetary dispersion of bounded identities. In fact, the analytical distinction that Ben made between the unbounded and bounded seriality of nationalism and cosmopolitanism extends his earlier argument in imagined communities that the nation should not be confused with race. Nationalism, Ben argued, is concerned with historical destiny. It's concerned with projecting a future. As a community of language, the nation is structurally open through invitation, and if one undertakes the ethical effort of learning the language, someone can become a member of a nation and participate in its ongoing project. In contradistinction, communities of blood are closed communities where membership is decided by the eternal past, the brute or mystical fact of descent. It is therefore striking that Ben's late thoughts on cosmopolitanism are framed by a greater acknowledgement that globalization processes, in particular technologies of transportation and communication, are important material conditions of possibility for anti-colonial nationalism in Southeast Asia because they enabled for the first time the trans-global coordination of revolutionary action. Globalization is here no longer menacing but a positive force for nationalism. However, globalization is projected back into an earlier period of history such that the end of the 19th century is now called the age of early globalization, which overlaps with the age of late colonialism and early nationalism. The global anarchist movement, one of its products, Ben writes, is a gravitational force between militant nationalisms on opposite sides of the planet. Now, this age then, for him, bears important lessons for progressive political movements in contemporary globalization. It gives rise to a cosmopolitanism that is in solidarity with anti-colonial nationalism. Now, I'm going to be very schematic and go through this really, really quickly. There are four aspects of this progressive cosmopolitanism that he elaborates in his interpretations of De Los Reyes, uh, Rizal, and Qui. They are unified by a figure that is also the late motif of the nation as a community of language, the structure of openness and the movement of opening. First, the writings of these authors are open in various respects. The writings of Reyes and Rizal, highly educated elite natives, are open at the level of conscious influence in terms of scholarly allusions and sources and at the unconscious level of what semiologists used to call intertextuality. De Los Reyes draws on the work of contemporary European ethnologists and folklorists and combines it with local research to undermine the intellectual credibility of colonial authorities. Rizal borrowed, and I quote, borrowed alchemically from key figures of the French, Dutch, and Spanish literary avant-garde to write what is probably the first incendiary anti-colonial novel written by a colonial subject outside Europe, end quote. Now, a related cosmopolitan openness is manifested in the multilingual character of their writing and correspondence. Multilingualism of various forms is the hallmark of colonial cosmopolitanism. And here, it is important to distinguish between two different modalities. 
First, the elite illustrado cosmopolitanism of the Philippines writers, and second, the more demotic cosmopolitanism of Kui. In the former case, the absence of an ugly, commercially debased international language, meaning English, meant that the real communications required the true hard internationalism of the polyglot. Ben notes, Filipinos wrote to Austrians in German, to Japanese in English, to each other in French or Spanish or Tagalog, with liberal interventions from the last beautiful international language, Latin. For Rizal and de los Reyes, Spanish was not so much the language of the colonizer and a marker of collaborationist status, but an international language of the Enlightenment that could be used to criticize the backwardness of superstitious, barely industrializing Spain, and the excesses of colonial power in the Philippines. In contrast, the Dutch East Indies was not administered through the colonizer's language, but through Malay, a local egalitarian language that does not exclude its addressees by situating them in the colonial hierarchy. Accordingly, Cui's linguistic cosmopolitanism takes the form of a freewheeling, bizarre, demotic Malay, which he modified with irregular orthography and syntax, and to which he added Dutch, English, and Hokkien vocabulary, and I think Hank was just pointing out to many other languages that he added. We have then a progressive cosmopolitanism grounded in the openness of languages to each other, their porosity, and their tendency towards hybridization. Now, this linguistic cosmopolitanism is directly related to the second aspect of cosmopolitanism, the experienced cosmopolitanism of interpersonal relations that affirm the rich cultural plurality of peoples. In the case of illustrado cosmopolitanism, the sociality that led to the cultivation of a worldly consciousness occurs as a result of travel abroad. Here, world citizenship is based on the capacity to visit other places and to stay for a while when one is invited. Cui's experience cosmopolitanism, on the other hand, is the reverse of the well-heeled enlightened traveler's cosmopolitanism of invitation. It is a cosmopolitanism of reception and visitation. It arises because the world came to the Dutch colony in the form of the influx of polyglot, polyethnic, and multiracial incomers from the 1880s onwards, British, Chinese, Americans, Germans, Austrians, Czechs, etc., who clustered in the port cities and spread out to the plantations and mines. The only condition of this cosmopolitanism of visitation and reception is that the visitors learn and appreciate the beauty of the lingua franca, here Malay. The language, style, and manner of address of Cui's writings enact a demotic cosmopolitanism, which is continuous, Anderson suggests, with the cosmopolitan ethics that he practiced in his daily interaction with others that his writings describe. His memoirs portray and enact a cosmopolitan sociality in which the paramount value is respect for other human beings, regardless of race and ethnicity. He does not describe the people he encounters in terms of their race. Although he's Peranakan Chinese, he is explicitly critical of the chauvinism of the resinicized diaspora, and he is sensitive about the tensions between the urban Chinese and the local native populations. Third, these progressive cosmopolitan practices are structurally compatible with nationalism because they are rooted. They are not antithetical to and do not transcend nationalism, but are instead an integral and mutually defining element of anti-colonial patriotism because they are concretely located in the nation to be. The Philippines to which the Illustrado returns or the East Indies which Cui never left. The nation is a host that welcomes others. The colonizer is a visitor that has overstayed its welcome and become a violent intruder or parasite that threatens to destroy the host. The important point here is that Anderson conflates cosmopolitanism with internationalism, and he extends cosmopolitanism's receptivity to others so that it becomes the very structure of nationalism. Echoing Hannah Arendt's idea of plurality, he notes that it is nonsensical to speak of a nation in the singular because by definition, a nation presupposes the existence of other nations. It is only in its relations with other nations, that is to say in internationalism, that a nation recognizes and affirms itself. Its very existence is therefore constituted in a field of international phenomenality. Its presentation or exhibition to Darstellung in the German sense and recognition by other nations in processes of specularization and spectacle 
in which the nation's unique identity and contributions to the world are displayed. This is illustrated in phenomena like sports contests and cultural exhibitions, where the performance and affirmation of nationness involves addressing and being seen by other nations and the world at large, and therefore nations constitutively inhabit an interlocutory field in which one receives as and is in turn received by others. Fourth and finally, because nations are constituted as self-determining in this field of receptivity, a weakening or at least a checking of sovereignty is structural to the nation. Indeed, the late colonial regime's lack of hegemony provides the material conditions for multilingual cosmopolitanism in the case of the Dutch Indies. This type of cosmopolitanism, he argued, is unlikely to emerge in major countries because they were ruled by states with nations that enforced a single national language. In contradistinction, the colonial state at the turn of the century could not command loyalty from the colonized population. It could not elicit nationalist sentiment because 95% of the population were not citizens. And it was not an assimilationist colonial power because it failed to inculcate the idea of Dutch superiority in the minds of the colonized. The lifting of regulations that segregated populations around 1910 caused the ghetto system to break down, especially that of the Chinese. And this enabled the formation of popular alliances across ethno-racial boundaries. More importantly, this cosmopolitanism that emerged under the weak or declining sovereignty of late colonialism was egalitarian. It possessed universality because the powerlessness of the natives meant that the friendly coalitions they formed to protest against colonial monopoly were not marked by particularistic self-interest, that is to say, the desire to obtain power for one's own group. Anderson envisions a state of horizontal comradeship that is devoid of a struggle for power amongst its members. Its universality comes from the renunciation of self-interest that arises from the historical fact of the powerlessness of the colonized actors. It is a cosmopolitanism without privilege, one that does not lead to hierarchy. It is marked by a certain artlessness because it is without self-interested ends, without teleology, and therefore, it's, and hence its affinity with anarchism. But although this colonial cosmopolitanism was compatible with nationalism, the opportunities for forming popular cosmopolitan alliances paradoxically diminished with the establishment of a national government after formal independence, because the government could command loyalty by drawing on national sentiment. At the linguistic level, the onset of official nationalism and its chauvinistic civilizational discourse saw the disciplining and sanitization of Malay as a national language, as Bahasa Indonesia, by the concerted eradication of mixed language. Dutch became the language of the enemy, Hokkien as the language of dubious loyalty, and other indigenous languages became markers of sectarian division. With this closing off of the openness of language, the complex hybridity that derived from the cosmopolitan openness of demotic bazaar Malay was lost. I've provided a schematic reconstruction of Ben's late romance with cosmopolitanism, because although it is an important turn in the trajectory of his thought, this part of his corpus is seldom discussed or largely unknown. Although we will never know how he would have developed this line of thought, I want to end with some comments that indicate a future uh, reflection. First of all, it is clear that Ben yearns for this pre-nationalist colonial cosmopolitanism. He regards it as a salutary shaping force for progressive popular nationalism, just as illustrado nationalism in the Philippines was fertilized by transnational anarchist networks. He also sees it as an important resource whose spirit can be reincarnated in order to correct the sanitizing and homogenizing impetus of later official nationalism in late globalization. And therefore, what is retained throughout his corpus is the paramount importance of the people or the nation as a phenomenon of collective consciousness and as an ethico-political principle of progressive transformation. Transnational networks and cosmopolitanism provide a fertile milieu, so to speak, but the people remains the organism at the center, uh, to adopt a metaphor from Kongiem. But how does Ben understand the central principle? 
the relation of nationalism to cosmopolitanism, which he appears to view as synonymous with internationalism, is not identical to that envisioned in German philosophy, as envisioned by Fichte's addresses to the German nation, where the universal ethos of cosmopolitanism achieves concrete embodiment or actualization in the nation. Rather, for Ben, cosmopolitan flows and processes, whether this is at the level of language, intersubjective exchanges and intercourse, or political organization and alliance, such as anarchistic networks, help to constellate and bring into alignment peoples resisting colonialism. Ben also subscribes to what can only be called a UNESCO view of the relation of a people to humanity in which the specific, the specific experiences of each and every people are universalizable because they make a contribution to the larger mosaic of humanity. And you will find this kind of argument in Giuseppe Mazzini or in San Yat-sen that one should first be a patriot because it is on this basis that one becomes a true member of humanity. It is a quasi hadarian argument, but in Ben's case, it is made with much greater attention to historical and linguistic specificity and to the global material forces that shape the historical conjuncture of a people's emergence and survival. Second, whatever hopes Ben had for late nationalism, and this hope is expressed in his analyses of the shame and dishonor, as well as the remainder of goodness of nations in some of the closing essays in the specter of comparisons, it must remain an open question whether the productive confluence of global forces and early nationalism can provide us with tools to understand progressive movements in the present, such as the networks of protest against neoliberal globalization today. What are the limitations of his historicist account of how the nation emerges with the weakening of sovereignty by cosmopolitan networks, which are, after all, primarily networks of market exchange? Does Ben give too much credit to the material processes of market activity? Indeed, can we still understand global capitalism today in terms of market exchange? Finally, you may have noted that many of these motifs in Ben's account of cosmopolitanism such as the openness to the other, visitation, the weakening of sovereignty that ushers in progressive transformation, bear an uncanny resemblance to motifs in the later Derrida's thinking of cosmopolitanism and the political. For example, Derrida characterized unconditional hospitality to the other as a hospitality of visitation, and he described the undoing of sovereignty as a freedom without autonomy and a heteronomy without servitude. But whereas for Derrida, these motifs refer to a quasi-transcendental vulnerability of power that arises from the fact that we are exposed without defense to the other because time and our very presence comes from the other, for Ben, these motifs arise from the contingent co confluence of forces in a particular historical conjuncture, namely late colonialism. However, because historical contingency is the ground for progressive transformation, the promise offered by colonial cosmopolitanism is fragile. It cannot survive because the lingua franca itself has changed when it is elevated into a homogenous national language by the national government after independence. More important, with the rise of nationalist Indonesia, the formerly powerless compete amongst themselves for power and coalitions become based on tactical self-interest. Powerlessness existed, Ben noted, but it was confined to the poor and the marginal. In this scenario, spontaneous popular cosmopolitanism disappears. It is replaced by the cosmopolitanism of the national elite, whose point of opening is solely to Western modernization. Uh, last uh, concluding paragraph. Ben laments the displacement of demotic cosmopolitanism in the same way that he had lamented the contamination of popular nationalism by the state in imagined communities. Um, there is a clear nostalgic melancholy um, in his writings, and this is a direct consequence of identifying contingency with history, such that contingency is always already only historical contingency. Is there not more of a chance for hope for change, a more radical opening onto a future that is always yet to come, if we see contingency not merely as the contingency of history, but instead as the ground of historical chance? And such are some of the questions I would put to him if he was here with us today. Thank you for your patience. Thank you.
Okay, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, Danlin? about your, oh, sorry. Uh, this is for Peng. I'm interested in your thoughts on the degree to which um, Ben's thinking might have been shaped by reading Fetish Recognition Revolution, um, Siegel's book on the emergence of Indonesian nationalism. You know, just like the emphasis that Siegel puts on openness to communication from afar, right? Is there a way in which Ben's thinking uh, later on might have had something to do with some of the things that he gained from Jim in that book. I mean, it's certainly possible, uh, given that, especially in that that uh, uh, that extract from the memoir, the forthcoming memoir that came out in uh, the London Review of Books, he did say that um, Jim was the pers was one of the people who most influenced him. But then it seems to me that there is a a generality to these kinds of motifs of openness that you know you can pick it up in a wide array of um, uh, writers, and I just picked on Derrida in this uh, in in what I said. Um, uh, the, I guess the more important question for me is what is the ground of this openness, right? And for Ben, I mean, it's this kind of these specific kinds of historical conjunctures. Right? But then once they happen, uh, there is a moment of genesis, so to speak. Um, but then the moment is not uh, repeatable. There's, it's, it's almost theological. There's almost something that's, uh, 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 that's a miracle, and then it happens, just as with the, the birth of the nation. Right? And then there's a, a, a kind of fall thereafter. And it seems to me that the, what he does then is to track the fall. And then there's a certain kind of melancholy um, involved, but yeah, certainly I'm sure. I mean, they mutually influenced each other. Yeah. I mean, he was he, uh, Ben was obviously, as you know, not as uh, uh, not as affectionate or as fond of uh, French post-structuralism as Jim was. It's a question right up here. Oh, sorry, Sanjay. Um. Actually, um, you know, I remember uh, Ben Anderson coming to Delhi and delivering a version of the uh, lecture on... Uh, huh? The cos colonial cosmopolitanism. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and for whatever reason, which I still don't quite understand, uh, he chose to use the language there of uh, subaltern cosmopolitanism. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I remember there was a fairly violent reaction from one part of the audience <laughs> and uh, who pushed back at him and said that they, were, they did not really see the point of this. Yeah. Um, but actually, what I was struck by, interestingly, while this conversation was going on, was that uh, I thought I saw, um, you know, after the very uh, complicated and tense yeah. ongoing relationship that had been there between him and Partho Chatterjee, yes. I thought I saw a convergence actually emerging here, because if you actually go to the early chapters of uh, Black Hole of Empire, yeah. Actually, uh, Chatterjee is there recovering some sort of form of a, uh, an, an idea of a pre-colonial cosmopolitanism, uh, you know, which he thinks basically uh, colonialism destroyed. Right. And I was I was a bit struck by this uh, that the two of them actually, you know, after the long fights over over homogeneous and heterogeneous time and all that, yeah. should eventually come to this. Yeah. So I, I think that's a very interesting uh, comment. I think that, I mean, sometimes with academics, because we are petty people, um, even great people like Ben uh, had his moments. Um, so um, I think, uh, I mean, there was certainly a knee-jerk reaction in Ben about post-colonial theory. Um, and I think for him, he primarily identified post-colonial theory with um, the subal subaltern studies folk. So in fact, this uh, 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 colonial cosmopolitanism piece was given in various places. He gave it at Columbia. Um, Danilin, the conference that you organized, did he also give the colonial cosmopolitanism piece? Okay, an, an earlier version. Yeah, so I mean, and he's, he's very strategic, so that's why I understand why he changed it to subaltern um, cosmopolitanism. Um, and uh, so in a sense, I think there is this kind of knee-jerk reaction, and um, he is a polemicist within uh, certain contexts. Um, but then in terms of the, the, the substance and the actual politics, I mean, he actually thought, uh, to use uh, your phrase, I think he actually thought Partha was a lovely guy. 
Um, whether Partha thought Ben was a lovely guy or not, that's a different story. But I think, I mean, Ben had great respect for Partha's work. So, I mean, I think, but I think you're right. I think if you looked at uh, the way that uh, Partha's argument goes, I think you can argue for a convergence. Other questions? Nancy. And then Vince. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I have an uneducated question. Um, it's related to something that Peng was talking about, and I think somebody else mentioned something about it this morning. And it has to do most of the time with when talking about cosmopolitanism and its relationship, the, the relationship among members of society based on the race and um, or their identity, their national identity, whatever. And whenever it's talked about in terms of the colonial period, it's as if in some of these conversations, anybody that's Indonesian is in the same category, is equal, is homogenous. And sh maybe I'm missing something in, in the way it's been, it's been discussed today, but surely Ben is not guilty of thinking that there was no class differentiation among Javanese peasants, uh, among diff people from different regions uh, of the country, uh, among uh, gendered subjects. And I'm just wondering why, uh, if you could just explain a little bit about that for me. He, Thanks. I mean, there is, so he, what he talks about in that essay in particular is this um, removal of these laws that segregated uh, uh, neighborhoods in terms of race and ethnicity. So uh, primarily he focuses on the Chinese because um, the, uh, this writer, Kui, is a Pranakan Chinese. Um, and what he wanted to show was that the, the multilingualism of Kui's own writing, which incorporated all these different languages, was made possible only because of the removal of these kinds of barriers. But he did say that neighborhoods were segregated, but then they were, the, the, the difference was now in terms of class and wealth and so on. However, um, there is in his writings a sort of, um, I guess it's a kind of utopian um, um, ideal where he thinks that daily interaction and market, uh, in market activity will um, uh, kind of erase these differences. Um, and you and Danadin talk, talked about the plural society, um, and you know one of his the reason why he liked Furnival a great deal, and the and, and this is a question he repeatedly asked. Um, I, I took a later version of that class, 1993. Um, a question that he repeatedly asked people was that what exactly does a market mean? And we tend to think of the market in terms of you know stock exchange or whatever, or in the Marxist sense, just you know broad uh, flow of commodities. But he was actually interested in the market as a place of face-to-face -face exchange, where you actually take things to sell, and you meet other people, and you converse with other people, and therefore this lingua franca, that, that's why he says of Malay, it's a, it's a bizarre language. Right? It's the language of actually the, the Madan or the place where people exchange things. Um, and I think for him, there was a kind of demotic egalitarianness to it. Um, the thing that he also emphasized in this colonial cosmopolitanism thing was at this stage, these people had no power. And their powerlessness meant that they could form uh, alliances that were not based on the desire to grab power. But that changes once these players, once the nation state comes into being, because then they all become uh, uh, agents and they have stakes in what's happening, right? So this, that, that's the affinity with anarchism, that's the affinity with uh, the powerlessness and the egalitarianism. Whether or not this is a pipe dream about market exchange and the bazaar, I mean, I, mean, I certainly think there's something uh, 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 naive about this. Um, but then it's also a Rousseauist ideal. It's the Marx who was pre-socialist. If you look at the early Marx, the critique of Hegel, you see a similar kind of uh, 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 Rousseauism there. And I think this is there in Ben. Can I follow up? Please. So I think maybe, knowing less about Malaysia than about Indonesia, I would accept that 
argument for the Malay Bazaar, but I just cannot believe that someone that lived in Java for the amount of time that he lived there would ever homogenize in that particular way. So I guess what I'm responding to earlier was the, the comment that he had the kind of UNESCO uh, approach to cosmopolitanism, which does flatten all these things. And, uh, well, no, no, no. It doesn't flatten all these things because it says each uh, people has something unique to contribute. They're unique. But again, there are people, and they're not differentiated. Well, the way he defines people is that they're internally open. In they're constitu the, constituent, the different constituencies and the, the different stakeholders, so to say, are um, open to each other. And that's why the, the focus on this demotic nature of this, the, the, this person's writing. Because it's okay. both, you know, it's English, Javanese, uh, Malay, everything. We'll duke it out later. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm not necessarily defending him. I'm just saying that's his argument. We've got time for a couple more questions. Vince. Vince? Uh, thank you for those papers. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the connection, there's an interesting connection to be made, I think, between the sort of literary astrology that Ben was wont to practice and the kind of cosmopolitanism that he was attracted to, which from the sound of it is a kind of cosmopolitanism from below. Yeah. Right? Uh, and it's a cosmopolitanism from below that uh, precisely conjures up certain utopic possibilities to the extent that... that um, it, it's less, it's less a, a fully formed social position, which was the last thing he would have thought a cosmop cosmopolitanism was about, but it was more like a field force, a yeah. field force for a whole variety of linguistic possibilities outside of existing social hierarchy. In other words, the possibility of being able to speak out of place. And so I think for him, that was the attraction of the marketplace. The marketplace was precisely a place where, where anything and everything could be said. And so yeah. that became, as it were, a foreshadowing of literature, of the literary, yeah. right? The market was, was precisely where certain kinds of literary impulses could be entertained, right? Yeah. So would you still characterize that as Rousseauist? Would, uh, uh, or if you connected it to this idea of literary astrology, it would be more Benjaminian than it would be Rousseauist? Well, it certainly... And does it make a difference? The character? metaphor yeah. that he uses is gravitational force. That's the astrology yeah. metaphor. Um, but then, then if you want to take that uh, seriously, then you need to go and look at you know, Euclid and Ptolemy and whatever it is. Um, but it's, a, it's the idea that there are affinities between things, right? But these affinities can go askew or you can never predict in advance, right? So it's not that kind of, I mean, it's not anarchistic in the sense that you just have this blind collision and apposition of particles. They have an affinity to each other. And that's why, um, uh, despite the separation, the force field actually creates an orderly right. universe. Right. Right? So in that sense, I would say um, it's Rousseauist. You have this whole interplay of the, the individual will, the particular will, and the general will, and yeah. that kind of thing. Right? But I, he would not have thought about it in, in these terms. I'm just trying to situate. I mean, he is never, he does not explicitly thematize. And the reason, um, the, the reason why I think he would, it, it's not Rousseauist is because it goes back to this earlier thing you said, which is there's a deeply tragic sense of history in Ben. Yes, I mean, you see which is Benjaminian. Yeah, you, you see it from the, you see it from the, from the, for example, in Java in a time of revolution, you know, where he, he makes this constantly makes this distinction between uh, there was a political revolution and there was a social revolution. The political revolution won out, and that's what we get now. But the social revolution is still going on, and, 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 and tragically has been sort of uh, ended and so forth. And I'm just wondering if, if that tragic sense of history, how that, uh, how you think that tragic sense of history connects with the sense of contingency that you were talking about. Contingency as something accidental rather than the ground of historical thinking. Because it seems to me these are two different models of history, right? But and what if the ground was accidentality? Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. But he, never he will never concede that. I mean, there's also the whole notion of the messianic. I mean, both in Benjamin and in, in Ben, because the, I mean, the, what he counterposes to homogeneous empty time, the time of nationalism, 
um, but then it's that kind of conjuncture of forces which you think of as, you know, the messianic rapture or whatever it is. So it's that, that certainly is there in his work also. But then there's the fall and then the lamentation of the, fall, the, tragic, the, the, the tragic fall. Which is what most Indonesianists go for. Yeah. They go for the fall. <laughs> Never for the messianic. Anything else? Okay, we're just about out of time, so why don't we thank our speakers and take a quick break.